It's you versus the restaurant. It's you versus the bar. How are waiters and waitresses and bar managers and restaurant managers and supermarket owners trying to get you to buy alcohol and trying to get you to buy more food? We're going to find out today with this wonderful conversation with a wonderful woman called Christy Nickel, who is a weight loss expert. Uh, She is an author, entrepreneur. She's a retired professional boxer. Uh, She's 46 years old from Boise, Idaho, and she's helped 200,000 people now to enjoy weight loss, to experience weight loss. Um, Yeah, her nickname is Code Red, Christy Code Red Nickel. And uh, Christy's been a great supporter of one of my other businesses, my sleep company, Swanick Sleep, for a number of years. She loves our blue light blocking glasses, uh, which you wear before you go to sleep at night, um, which blocks the artificial light from your screens and uh, helps you to sleep better. And uh, Christy is just an occasional drinker. Uh, You'll hear her share her story about how she grew up um, with her parents making sure that she didn't drink, uh, but still she drank socially in her 20s. um, But now today she realizes all of the negative health consequences of any level of drinking. Um, She also has a a younger sister who drinks quite heavily, she shares, and her grandparents were were both alcoholics. So Christy, in this uh, upcoming interview, talks about her experience with family drinking. Also, because she's a former waitress herself, she is going to reveal how waiters and waitresses and bar managers are trying to get you to drink. As you've probably experienced, you go into a restaurant, you sit down for a meal, and the, the waiters and waitresses are like, oh, can I get you started with a drink? And they're kind of suggesting that you start to consume their attractively packaged poison. So how do you combat that? We're going to find out in today's conversation, Uh, as well as if you'd like to lose weight in general, if you'd like to be healthier. Christy's got a few little tips there. And we're going to talk about the damaging effects of alcohol and the dead calories that you consume when you do uh, drink alcohol. You're going to find out Christy's very upbeat, very positive, very confident. So if you are an introvert, uh, a little bit shy, maybe you struggle with social situations without ha- um, having a glass of wine or a beer in your hand, Christy's got a few tips there for how you can be more confident without the alcohol. And uh, yeah, enough from me. Let's get right into it, shall we? Here is Christy Nickel. It's you versus the restaurant. What was your drink of choice when you were drinking, Christy? Let me think here. What back in the you know it went through phases, of course. Like you know, I I, I would go out and everybody would be like, "We're all doing Jaeger, Jaegermeister <laughs> shots or something," and and I would you know I would try that, but I so I never drank enough to really. Li- create a habit of it to where it was like, this is my drink. I was kind of just doing whatever everybody else was doing. Yeah. Where, where did you grow up and what was the culture around drinking where you were growing up? When I grew up in the mountains of Northern Idaho on a big farm and my dad was a police officer and our local minister. So I had my, and it was a small town of only 2000 people. And, uh, might talk about a fishbowl life. So it was made very clear to us up front, us girls up front, that drinking was absolutely not tolerated being preachers, kids like, and of course, Pentecostal preacher kids where we didn't wear makeup. We wore dresses. Like it was really, really strict religions. Like the thought of drinking, we, Oh no, not even like, no, 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 not even. And my parents, even being adults, you know, wouldn't, neither of them drank. I think my mom had her first glass of wine when she was 40, 50 years old or something. And so, yeah, growing up, it was extremely frowned upon. And of course, because it was so heavily of a heavily religious, we would, and it, I'm sad to say this now, we would frown upon and we would look down on people who did drink like, oh, you can't go over to Sally's house because her parents drink, you know, and it was just, it was misunderstood, but it was it was it was taken to the extreme of no alcohol at all growing up. Wow. It kind of reminds me of that 1984 movie Footloose with Kevin Bacon where uh, dancing and music is outlawed in the small religious town and all the kids want to rebel and go and dance anyway, whereas you, it seemed like you didn't want to rebel and go and drink anyway. Is that is that fair to say? 
Yeah, because my parents talk, taught us early on because both my grandparents were alcoholics on my mother's side. My mom, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know a lot about addiction. I don't know if it really is it passed along uh, um, generationally, but she told us it was. And so she said, you know, you don't want to end up like your grandparents. And so it just kind of stuck. But yeah, it was a lot. I, there were a lot of similarities in the movie Footloose and my life growing up like, daddy, I just want to dance, you know, and and my dad was a disciplinarian. He absolutely he had seen too many people killed in drunk driving accidents. And it just that was just not tolerated. And then couple that with my mom saying, you don't want to be addicted to alcohol like your grandparents. It just was not anything we, I was too scared. I was a middle child. And so my, my older sister and I, the firstborn and the middle child, we followed rules. It was my little sister who did not. You got it. Okay. So you, you never really drank a lot or on a only on occasion throughout your life. And you're 46 now, 46 years old now. So let me just, let me start by asking what has been your alcohol relationship over the years then? from when you were a child where it was frowned upon to today? When I got old enough and of course, um, you know, I, I started to try it. Um, you know, I was, I was afraid to, because I didn't want anything, you know, you, you just, we'd heard horror stories from the church, you know, and, and I love Jesus. I'm just, so I frowned upon deep religious stuff, you know, but, and, and so the like, Oh, you can't, you you're going to act like this. And so it, it was always extreme. It was in my mind. And so I was afraid to try. And when I did try, of course, being, a um, you know, the size I was and being that I had no tolerance to it, I was a lightweight weight and I'd get, you know, I would get buzzed pretty easily. And like, you know, um, I was, my first marriage was to a, um, uh, a guy who played football for Ole Miss. And if you know anything about the sec, they are heavy drinkers and heavy partiers down there. So I felt so much pressure, um, early on in my early twenties, my mid twenties to, to drink with everybody. That's just what everybody did, Christy. And so whenever I would be, I would drink alcohol. I would get, you know, I would get mouthy. I would get like, yeah, let me just tell you something, you know? And, oh my God, it was just, it was not good. And, um, I didn't, I just, I, I learned early on that that's kind of, that's kind of what I did. I just would dabble here or there, but then when I get a little bit buzzed, I, uh, I would, I would dance. So that's the only thing that made me kind of keep coming back to it once in a while would be because when you do get a little bit buzzed, it makes you free of your inhibitions and you can, you can get out there and, and just really dance, you know, and not care what other people think. Cause at that age, now at my age, I don't give a rat's fanny what anybody thinks no matter what. But at that age, you know, I didn't have the confidence I have now. So I would take anything to help me low, you know, to, to lower my inhibitions and get out there and just have a good time. So that's the only thing I use alcohol for was just to have a good time in a social setting, mostly dancing. And that was mostly in your, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly in your twenties, it sounds like. So Subsequently, since then, have you learned social skills or health skills that enables you to now go and dance and let loose and have fun or whatever without drinking alcohol? Yeah, I have loads of confidence now. I mean, I got enough confidence for everybody. Like, there's no lack of confidence for me. And I, you, I am so heavily in favor of getting, of not needing any alcohol to do what you want. And, and I, um, I, I just, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so, yeah, my confidence is, is so healthy that I can, I can do anything from skydiving to dancing in front of people to getting, I've, I've spoken on cry, you know, I'm on stages where there were 6,000 entrepreneurs in the audience. Like, I just don't even, it doesn't even cross my mind. Like, who I could really use a drink right now to, to settle these nerves or boy, I could use a little liquid courage. So I don't even, I don't even think about those things. I have worked on myself and I have built myself up to the level that I am. And I've just, you know, you live life and you just learn, uh, at least I think at this age now, I mean, I'm just like, ah, shoot, everybody's so screwed up that if somebody thinks I'm screwed up, that eh, I mean, it just doesn't bother me. So I definitely don't need alcohol to help me out in any situation. For maybe a more introverted person who's listening or even an extroverted person who, who recognizes they don't have the same level of confidence as you, how have you been able to manufacture that confidence 
that's enabled you to go and stand in front of crowds and not drink or go to social situations and not drink? I, you mentioned self-development, but how have you manufactured this confidence over the years? This is one of the biggest questions that is asked of me and all the things that I, that I do. And I, and what really helped me was when I, when I had my show on MTV, MT, I had a show back in the mid two thousands. I think it came out in 2005, 2006, and it was called MTV's made. And it was the high, one of the highest producing, highest grossing MTV shows. And it was the season premiere and it was, it was replayed in over 60 countries. And I got to be pretty uh, well known at that time. And so I, I took a job training celebrities in New York city. And so I lived in New York city for five years. And that's when I came face to face with all these celebrities that, that people unfortunately idolize and they envy and they're, they're jealous of, and they wish they had a life like that. Well, I work with them very closely. I worked with them at 6. AM when they came into the gym with two socks that weren't matching, they hadn't brushed their teeth. They stunk. They were like, and I realized really quickly working with these, these A-list celebrities that they are no different than you or me. And most of them are a lot of them have cocaine habits and a lot of them are more screwed up than us. And so I quickly realized, oh my gosh, what on earth have I got to be self-conscious about? What on earth have I got to be, um, you know, feeling like, what, why, why is my confidence so low? I, I have got nothing to be. And that was really what it was, was coming face to face with all those people. And also one of my clients was one of those Photoshop people that, that uh, like magazines would send her a photo to be ready for the magazine cover. And she would, and she would show me the before and after before picture. And then the after picture of when she got done doctoring it. And I saw celebrities bodies firsthand. And I, and it just made me realize, well, if these a list multimillionaire, you know, the, some of the people that I trained, Katie Couric, Ethan Hawke, Claire Danes. I mean, all these Chris Knopf, all these big celebrities I trained, if they are no different than me, then why the heck am I feeling so low? So I got nothing to worry about. And it just changed my mind like that. Mm. So it was spending time in Hollywood culture around a list celebrities and seeing that they were just like anyone else that really helped foster a persona in yourself of I'm just me. I'm just, I'm just going to be free. I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I'm going to be confident and I'm going to feel that confidence. That's amazing. That's yeah. uh, what, what, what would you suggest for someone who doesn't get to hang out with celebrities and maybe get that comparison? How do you think they could manufacture that kind of confidence? Yeah. I don't want this to be like a celebrity bashing kind of um, uh, uh, thing that we go down. But I do want to say, because I, I actually was a film journalist for many years. I lived in Hollywood and I interviewed movie stars for about eight or nine years. And I got to go to the Playboy Mansion and the Oscars and the Golden Globes. And I, 
I mean, name a A-list celebrity. I've probably at, at the very least interviewed them, if not spent spent time with them. And what's really interesting is with the passage of time, now years later, because I haven't been in that game in, oh, let's see, 12, 12, 15, 12, 13 years, I start seeing these people who I interviewed 12, 13 years ago in the press for all of these awful things. For example, you mentioned Chris Noth, who played the character of Mr. Big in the Sex in the City TV series. Um, you know, if you follow pop cultural news, he had a lot of sexual um, assault accusations labeled at him um, over the years. And then, you know, you, if you've been watching the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard court case, um, you can just see, you know, things that are behind the facade of this perfectly manicured public persona are often, you know, quite ugly at times. And I'm not saying it's ug- they're, they're uglier than the average person. They're just probably like as u- they're probably as ugly as all of us, right? But uh, to speak to your point, um, you know, I was uh, at the time I was quite impressed with a lot of the people that I interviewed, and I still am. But then subsequently, after a decade later, I start to see these stories coming out of people. I'm going, wow! Like they must have been just as messed up as the rest of us all, all along. You can relate to that. Yeah, and I'm so glad to hear that you could relate to what I. I mean, yeah, you had a front row seat. You 100 percent know what I'm talking about. And, and and my dad's a therapist, and he says, "Oh, I go like people say to us, I'm just so messed up." Which I mean, I'm in weight loss, and people say to me, you know, like, oh, "What's wrong? Why, why can't I'm so messed up?" I say, oh, "Oh, I got news for you, Karen." we're all messed up. And my dad always says that like, Hey, listen, we've all got our stuff. And so it is, it's nice to know that we've all got our stuff, even the people that we look up to, but we're not seeing the whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to do one more celebrity conversation here. Then we'll move on from this. One thing that's always troubled me a little bit is the rock Dwayne Johnson. I, I, he is a very, very nice, lovely man. At least that's my experience. That was my experience of him when I interviewed him a few times um, over the years, he always seemed very genuine, very nice. But he is like many other celebrities today, um, promoting alcohol brands. He's got a tequila brand. It's one of the fastest moving tequila brands on the market. It's probably going to be worth more than the billion dollars that George Clooney sold uh, his uh, his alcohol brand for. So because I'm in this world of helping to educate people around the damaging effects of alcohol, my heart kind of sinks heart sinks a little bit when I see celebrities like Dwayne Johnson actively promoting liquor brands, because I know, and you probably know as well, because you're very health conscious, that there is absolutely zero benefit to alcohol, zero nutritional benefit. In fact, um, the World Health Organization, if you're, you know, depending on what you think of the World Health Organization, but they say there is absolutely no level of alcohol that is good for you. In fact, any level of alcohol is bad for you. There's varying degrees of bad. So it kind of pains me to see folks like Dwayne Johnson promoting something that they must know is bad for human beings. Do you have any any thoughts around that or any feelings around that? Yeah, I 100%, 100% agree with you. You're talking someone who is um, such a huge, one of the top most influential people on the planet and, and, and that's the way he's spending his time. And, and that's the way that, um, and it's really sad to see. And there, and, and I, I see him drinking that tequila and I quit following him on Instagram because I just couldn't, I didn't want to see that anymore. I don't follow anybody who, who drinks. I just don't want to see it. It just doesn't line up with my views. And I'm, I'm very not tolerant to that. And I think I, I see the body that he has and I know that he works out hard and I'm thinking, You know, he poses with this tequila shot and he's kind of holding it like this. And I'm thinking, I wonder how much he really does drink, because in my 28 years in this industry, I have not seen someone be able to maintain that level of health and still consume alcohol. I mean, it's the first thing we do on my program is we you have got to you cannot you cannot get lean and ripped and and lose weight and get yourself metabolically healthy while still drinking alcohol. So I always see that. I'm thinking, boy, that's a mixed message if I've ever heard one. Mm. Tell me a little bit about what you what you do and how you help people and why do you specifically request that they stop drinking alcohol when they go through a program of yours? I created a nutrition program that enables people to lose 10% of their body weight every month without shakes, pills, diet foods, or exercise. We do it based on real food, water, and sleep, which we believe is the, is the proper human diet. I have 
I've been married a couple of times. <laughs> I've been married a couple of times. And you're so have, confident. You're like, let me yeah. get married a couple of times. Let's do this. Let's just it's embarrassing, we'll upgrade. You have to just <laughs> laugh it off like, oh, geez, Christy, you know, and I have seen in both of my marriages, uh, alcohol be a problem, not um, not to the addiction level, but just a, a problem. And I've never and I, what I've experienced and I used to. So I've watched both of my exes try to get lean and couldn't while still drinking. And that's one thing. But then I've had a, hundred, a couple of hundred thousand people go through my program at this point. The program has just gotten huge. And I used to allow people to have a cheat meal once a week. And the the whole the whole induction or people consuming the alcohol and the sugar would set them back a whole week of progress. And it was just, we were doing one step forward and two steps back. And I wasn't able to make any progress with these people. And what it is is the alcohol makes them free of their inhibitions. So it might not look, if you take a, a, a gin and a, um, a diet tonic, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's the most, it's the least I guess bad of all the alcohols. If I, if you, if you want to look at it that, or so people think, but that's not what happened. That's not the problem. The problem is that combined with the entire sleeve of Ritz crackers, and then they go face down in a big box of Mike and Ike's and then, and then, and then, and then there's more alcohol and then it's taco Tuesdays and woo. And then the shirt's coming off and it just gets it. Nobody can do what the doctor recommends of one glass for a woman, two glasses for a man. I, you know, so I notice with my people that you give them an inch, they take a mile and I just say no to everybody. Nope. Because I've never seen it work. And people come to me because they're sick and they're fat and they're metabolically broken and they cannot get healthy while drinking. I have tried to let my clients do it. And it never has worked. And you can sit there and argue with me. So you're not you, James, I'm talking about the global you, you can, you know, I got people that try to argue with me, like, you know, like beach body coaches or weight, weight loss coaches. And they're saying, well, Christy, now, you know, uh, moderation, you know, you got to let people bull crap. Have you looked around this country, 350 million people in America and we're 88% fat, like no moderation ain't working. So you and if you look at the, my success rate with my clients versus other people, like I've got a better success rate. And so I don't care what anybody says. I have never, 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 never seen anybody have success on my program or any weight loss program and still be drinking. They just don't mix. Mm. It's, a, it's interesting what you said there, because it's not just the sugar like, look, when you consume alcohol, it turns to sugar and it's dead calories, right? Which is going to compromise your weight loss goals automatically. So that's one component of it. The other co component, to speak to your point, is that when you drink alcohol, you start to crave carbohydrates. So you're more likely when the waiter or the waitress comes over to say yes when he or she offers you, oh, would you, can I get you some dessert? Or when, when you're, you're ordering food, food you're, you're more likely, likely to say, yeah, let me have, have the fries versus the salad, for, for example. Um, you know, anyone will tell you once they've had a couple of drinks, drinks, they want to go to the, go to the fridge, fridge, they want to go to the cupboard, cupboard they want to chow down, down on something. So now you're actually eating additional calories. And for the most part, the calories that you know, they're additionally eating are things, things like, like the crackers, crackers that you, you referenced, referenced before. Um, um, so you've so got, you got this kind of kind double whammy, whammy where you're, you're drinking, drinking dead calories, calories and then you're inspired to go and eat even more calories because, because you've, you've got, got that, that hunger, hunger, right? Right. You're hundred percent right. And I waited tables in college. I waited tables for about 10 years. I was a waitress and I was counting on those upsells. I would say, I'd walk up to a table and I would say, you don't ask us what you don't, you're not supposed to say, what can I get started for you? They say, which daiquiri can I get started for you? Or, or how about, uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab a gin tonic for you and I'll be right back. Does that sound good to you? It's all suggestive. You're hoping that that customer starts to drink because honey, Katie bar the door. It is going to be so much easier to sell them appetizers and desserts, which are the two biggest money makers in addition to alcohol. Um, it just, it's appetizers, desserts, upsell, upsell, up, get that ticket up and up and up. And then of course they're tipping 20% on top of that. Yeah. I'm hoping, I mean, as a waitress, I was like, come on alcohol, come on alcohol. Cause I knew they were going to let that wallet go. If I could get them to start drinking. I want you to tell me more about that. Tell me more about what you were taught on how to get people to spend more money. Because I always coach this in my, in my program which is when uh, when you walk into a restaurant, 
the waiter or the waitress says, oh, yeah, hello, have you got a reservation? And you might say yes, and then they'll say, oh, your table's not quite ready. Would you like to just go over and have a drink at the bar and I'll come over and grab you when your table's ready? So there you go. There's a suggestion. Go and drink at the bar. Then when they sit down, they come over and they say, hello, nice to meet you. I'll be your waiter or waitress. Can I get you started with, uh, with a couple of drinks? Suggestion, suggestion, suggestion. So can you just walk us through again? Because I'd love for you to just walk through the mindset of a waiter or a waitress or a, or a bar or restaurant manager. What are they trying to get you to do the moment you walk into their establishment? This podcast is sponsored by my eyewear and sleep optimization company, Swanick. If you suffer eye strain from computer use, you find it challenging to focus and concentrate, your sleep is poor, you have low energy, you're tired and sometimes experience anxiety, then it could be because you're staring into screens all day and night. Swanick produces stylish blue light blocking glasses to help you sleep better and generate more energy and focus during the day. A Harvard University and University of Washington published study revealed that Swanee's wearers reported sleeping 14% better during the night and were 9% more productive during the day. That's huge. Swanee's are currently worn as a sleep and performance aid by professional athletes at teams including the Dallas Cowboys, New York Knicks, Manchester United, and many more. They've been featured on media, including The Dr. Oz Show, Live with Kelly and Ryan, and The New York Times. I personally designed Swannies back in 2015, and they've now helped almost 200,000 people sleep and perform better. And because you're a listener of the Alcohol Free Lifestyle podcast, you can now get your pair and enjoy 15% off. To get the best blue light blocking glasses on the market, go to swannies.com and enter code JAMES at checkout for 15% off. That's swannies.com and enter code JAMES at checkout for 15% off. It's so funny because all these years later, I still use these very same tactics to try to sell in my program. I mean, it's it's classic sales technique. And so what we're it, you you hit the nail on the head. You said suggestions. So what I would I would experiment with different ways to say it when I was doing it. And so um, I would say I would try not to ask. I would say I would assume. So I'm. I, if I were running a restaurant, I would teach my servers to, you know, and, and I say this even to my sales team, we have a sales team that we do phone sales. And so I say, you just, you just assume the sale, like you assume you nod your head. So it's a lot of facial expression and you point your finger, uh, you know, it, or showing the glass of, you know, we bring out a glass. We have a technique where I would walk past the table that, was, that just got seated while I was delivering a drink to another table. I'd swing by and I'd say, Hey guys, I'll be right with you. One second. Let me deliver this, this uh, strawberry daiquiri over here to this other table. In fact, you know what? How about I go ahead and make a couple of, let me put that in the computer and let me have that the bartender make you guys a couple of these. This sounds good. You hold it up in front of their face and make (laughs) them see it and smell it. And look at that salt around the rim. Look at how beautiful red that is. And it's, it, it's amazing how easily, how easily the human can be manipulated by just the power of suggestion. You want to nod the head, you want to keep on contact and you just want to almost turn your body. Like it's an understood thing. Am I, I'm grabbing you a bar. Did I, did I hear you say you wanted an IPA? Is that what I heard you? No, I didn't say that. Oh, which I'm sorry. Which bar, which, which bar drink did you say you wanted? Oh, I, well, I wasn't going to, will you drive home? Cause I'll have a, okay. All right. Let's go ahead and do a gin tonic. Amazing. It, it's just a matter of suggesting to them. And, uh, you know, and like, you know, guys, we've got stuffed mushrooms. I just actually, before my shift started, I tried some stuffed mushrooms. They were so good guys, fresh out of the oven. I can have them out here in about four minutes. How about I go ahead and put an order in for you? I did not ask. I did not ask. I said, how about I, can I put an order in for you? Or how about I go ahead and just put an order in for you? Nodding my head and And turning my body like it's understood and I'm starting to walk away. And yeah, I can have that, you know, so a lot of psychological things going on when you're suggesting and alcohol is the biggest thing. So 
that was how I handled it. It was a lot of nodding, a lot of just assuming that's what they came in there for, assuming everybody wanted a drink. And the 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 conversion rate, I think it was about 80%. I mean, I was good at it, James. I was good at it. <laughs> I, I, I often think when I go to a restaurant and I sit down and the waitress or the waiter comes over to me and says, can I get you a drink? Can I say, yes, please, I'll have a water, ice, and a piece of lime. I'm often thinking, oh, their heart must be sinking. Like, they must be like, oh, I'm not going to really make a good tip on the tip. <laughs> Yeah. So for the listener uh, who's, you know, going into a restaurant, I often tell them it's you versus the waiter or you versus the restaurant or it's you versus the supermarket. Because when you walk into many supermarkets, they've got the liquor strategically placed to try to get you to buy it. Uh, any any tips on how the listener who's trying to kind of, you know, diffuse a situation where they might say yes to alcohol? Any Any tips for them? Well, the, the, there are some of the brightest minds on the planet have, have psychologically analyzed grocery stores and has set it up for you to fail. And so you're going in with the, the cards stacked against you. So when you go into a restaurant, when you go into a grocery store, when you go, when you go out with your friends, you need to understand. I like to tell my clients, no, before you go, you need to be prepared before you go in and understand what you are going to be bombarded with. You are going to be up against the wall here. You're, you're fighting a losing battle, but I'm telling you, you can do it. You know, stay on the perimeter of the, of the grocery store. Some state laws make it to where the liquor, the liquor area of the grocery store has to be sectioned off in a little bit away. Um, so you know, it, it helps to not, you know, I not go past it. Um, but knowing, you know, the time of day you eat. I mean, nobody craves a gin tonic at 9 a.m. unless you got a serious problem. So understand that your willpower wanes as the day goes on and the evening comes and you've got no willpower left and you're like face down at a plate of nachos and three margaritas later, you're calling an Uber. So understand that you are fighting an uphill battle here. It sets yourself up by being prepared before you go. Just maybe you need to say no. Maybe you you know need, have a plan in place if you are going to go out and you've got goals that do not include drinking, you need to set your up, yourself up with a good, solid plan. Maybe have some support around you that are going to stand with you and say, no, you know what? That's okay. I won't drink it. Water for both of us. Yeah, we're the DDs, <laughs> you know, and know that people are bullies. They're going to bully you. I don't know what it is about social drinking. I have a couple of uh, tips that I've taught my clients where they go to, and they get a Moscow mule copper cup, the one that has the Moscow mule. There are certain drinks that have certain cups. And if you fill it full of ice and water and put a lime on the edge and a little straw and just hold it, people will leave you the F alone. But if you are not holding anything or you got a bottle of water, you're, you're going to get some bullies and they're going to be like, Hey, why you, why aren't you drinking? Oh, uh, you know, not really want to. Oh, Christy code red told you you can't drink what you not an adult or something. And here it starts in, but, 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 So sometimes just holding a fake drink might <laughs> get people to leave you alone. Yeah. It's funny. It's uh, when you said it's the, the, the supermarkets are set up to get you to buy stuff. There's a Coles supermarket in Brisbane, Australia, where I am at the moment as I'm recording this. And I've noticed uh, a couple of nights this week when I've gone down to the supermarket late at night after my meal, because I eat, eat kind of early and I finish, and I go down there just to buy some soda water. And as I'm going to the checkout, they've strategically placed this uh, little refrigerator of mochi. Do you know what mochi is? It's kind of like that. I think it's Japanese ice cream or something like that. And it's like serve yourself. And these, these beautiful things, it's so, so lovely. And it's right where you wait in line to go to check out. And I got to admit that I have succumbed the last, a couple of nights in the past week where I've gone and I've actually pulled out a couple, put them in the thing and then gone and checked and bought it in addition to the soda water that, that I bought. And I'm like, 
This is called so Im- impulse items. Impulse items. That's what they're called. Impulse items. And they're huge sellers. Huge sellers. And they must, it's the greatest upsell for supermarkets because they must have got another, well, they got another $9 out of me this past week that they ordinarily weren't going to get. And and they've done studies that show that if if supermarkets or any kind of store for that matter can just get you into their establishment, you're likely to buy on average three items more than what you had planned when you first walked in. So I walked in looking for um, uh, Pellegrino water, soda water, because I like to drink soda water. And I walked out with Moki, with Moki ice cream, you know, and paid an extra $9. And I did that twice this last, this last week. So it's smart and it's clever, but it's also, you know, now that you know what's going on, hopefully, listener, you'll be able to navigate that uh, next time. Well, I notice that when I go into some place when I'm tired or run down or um, coming off an event and I'm just so I'm worn out that I'm much more likely to succumb to those um, those items. And mm. I and the impulse items, the longer you wait in the line. Yeah. And they're at the level of your children. I mean, you can't even go into a hardware store without you can't even buy a doorknob without having Snickers bars and candy and soda and junk food. And oh, it, right there. You're like, I'm just trying to buy some nails for crying out loud. So the deck is stacked against us for sure. So I always tell my clients, we set ourselves up for success by not going into those stores tired and run down. Don't go at night if you can help it. You know, don't go when you've got nothing left in your tank and your your willpower is gone because your willpower runs out as the day runs out. Ours, all of ours does. And yes, it and try to try to just not go in to a losing situation, but you're right. That place is good. They're good. <laughs> and just change your routine as well. I mean, I, I had a client a few years ago, his name was Jared in Man- Minnesota and he was 350 pounds more or less. And he drank a liter of Coca-Cola every day. And so he had this, he was addicted to, to Coca-Cola essentially. And what we figured out in coaching was that uh, he would buy the Coca-Cola at the end of his work day when he was walking between the office and the bus stop because he always walked past a Target store and the Target had a big Coke machine inside of it. So all we did was to help him get over this Coke addiction, Coca-Cola addiction, was to have him walk the long way to the bus stop before he got on the bus and went home. And the long way was only another two and a half minutes. So, but because he, he, he no longer walked past the target store, he didn't see the target store. He didn't walk into the target store. He just went directly from his office to the bus and went home. He didn't drink the Coke. I also recall, he also said that he bought a lot of Coke when he filled his car up with gas. And I said, from now on in, don't go into the store and pay for the gas, just pay it at the pump. Now, there are a lot of places that you you just have to go into the store. They don't take credit cards at the pump, but there is also a lot where you can just pay pay for the for the gas at the pump instead of having to go in the store and so just by making that rule in his life that now if he can pay for the gas using his credit card at the pump he will that also reduced the amount of coca-cola that he drank and in the three months that i that at least i was working with him he lost 50 50 something pounds i don't not sure i don't think he quite broke the 300 pound mark it was something around that but he just changed a little bit of his habit a little bit of his routine and that helped result in a 50 pound weight loss. Yeah, that's amazing. And I know I, when I was, when I was sugar addicted, I would eat peanut M&Ms. I eat a lot of them every single night. And then when I was going through counseling for it, cause it was a bad addiction, my counselor had me also walk a different route to where I wasn't going by that same store. So you're right. Small changes. You don't need to be, I got people tell me I'm an all or nothing person. I'm an all or nothing, but you don't need to be an all or nothing person. You can make small changes that can make a huge impact. Yeah, I love that. So let's just wrap this up, Christy. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Uh, uh, You had referenced that your younger sister drinks quite a lot still to this day. And then you had also referenced that you had grandparents who you described as alcoholics. So how has that family dynamic both, uh, how has that impacted your perception of alcohol in general? 
Yeah, I, I heard stories of when my grand when my mom was younger and her parents would drink and then and, and, and abuse, you know, they'd, they'd they would beat the kids and and you know it was just really sad. And so I grew up with all kinds of horror stories. And my grandparents were never, you know, on mom's side, were they were never really involved in our life. And we in anytime they were involved, they was always drinking, they were always drinking, and we could always smell it on them. And you know, and of course, we would always we didn't you know, we just didn't quite put it together when you're young, young. And then when you start to get older, you're like, Oh geez, this is pretty rotten. And then my, my little sister just got into addiction early on drugs and alcohol. And she has been addicted for over 20 years and it has ruined her life. And I've watched this happen. Um, and part of the reason that's part of the reason that deters me from ever coming near it. I just don't, I, I don't, I would never get to her level and I never did, but you know, she's an actual addict an actual alcoholic. Um, and it's just, I've never seen her sober. I've never seen her sober and I never saw my grandparents sober. And I, I that really stuck with me that, wow. I mean, so many people's lives have been ruined from these few people that I've known who refuse to get help and, and they're just choosing this kind of life for themselves. And so it really impacted me. Um, and the little bit of that I had drank in the past, it always ruined the next day for me. So it was never just being sick and, and, and throwing up or something, you know, it was, it was the entire next day and sometimes the day after. And I was like, boy, you don't have a lot of time on this earth and watching my grandparents both die young and watching my sister ruin her life. And she's, younger than me, but she looks like an old shoe. She's so beat up that that taught me that I don't want to waste any days on this earth. Why would I want to waste any time being sick? Because that's what alcohol does. It robs you of your life and you do not have a lot of it left. I mean, you might be in your 20, maybe you're in your 20. You're like, Oh, I will believe me. You'll be where we are right now. And then you'll be where, you know, it, it happens to all of us. And why would you want to waste any time? So that's what kind of kept me just watching, watching the lives break down, watching the early death, watching all the problems, watching the DUI and going to jail and, and all the drug use. And, and, and I just was like, wow, I don't want to have anything to do with that. So it, it, I learned real quick. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that a little bit about your family, Christy. Appreciate that. And to speak to the point, it's fascinating how, different, excuse me, how different people look when they've had a lifetime of drinking alcohol, even if they're not, even if they haven't been alcoholics, even if they've just been consistent, socially acceptable drinkers, which might mean a couple of drinks a night, you can see it showing up in people's faces and complexion years later. Do you, do you notice that as well? Yeah, I noticed that because my mom drinks more than she should. And um, her skin is, uh, you know, it should, I do, you just, it shows up. They just look beat up. They look like they've been road hard and put away wet. And it's just like, golly, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of money on Botox and I, I, I want this to laugh. Like I want to, you know, I don't, and I, you know, I drink a lot of my water, but I want to preserve my youth for as long as possible. Cause you do, you look at people because normally the drinking is accompanied by smoking and probably by doing some drugs and boy, it just does a number. I mean, the body just breaks down so quick and usually bad eating habits. And of course, now you got sugar breaking down your know, sugar. We know feeds into disease. It, it ages the organs. It's just, mm. so these guys look so beat up way older than what they usually are. They, mm. it does, it beats them up. It robs them. On the flip side, if you can live an alcohol free lifestyle, if you choose to live an alcohol free lifestyle and more than that, a healthy lifestyle in general. I don't just mean physical health and nutrition or movement, mobility, exercise, but mental health as well. And and a big component of being strong with your mental health is is not drinking alcohol and pouring gasoline on a, you know, anxiety fire, so to speak. The flip side is is that if you can, you know, focus on good health and nutrition and mental health, you end up looking Amazing. And I know this is not just all about vanity and ego and how you look. That's just one component of it. But it's amazing how better looking you get when you feel good about yourself inside. 
Yeah, there's a spark in your eye. There's just a smile. You know, I, I right now I'm wearing a lot of makeup and I got, wow, the hair is going. But a half of the week I don't. I go to my cabin, no makeup, and I'm just as pretty as I am now. And it's because my eyes are clear, because my teeth are, are white. It's because I have this glow. And it's not just the glow of the good water coming through. It's a glow of the confidence. It's a glow of the happiness. It's a glow of, of the fact that I love myself. And I'm, I'm so happy with my life. And I don't have any stress in my life. And I'm just really an overall happy person with, with loving relationships, you know, with a, with a healthy dog and I have gratitude and all that comes through and it's only dampened. It's only, it's, it's only worsened if you do allow things like alcohol and sugar and stress and, and bad habits to come into your life smoking. But man, when you, when you live an all around, like you mentioned, healthy lifestyle, people just think healthy. They think water. Well, no, it's spirituality. It's, it's food, it's movement, it's sunlight, it's re loving relationships. It's, it's the, doing the things that make you happy. You can see it on someone's face. I smile all the time, whether I'm, you know, whether it's like this or it's barefaced or whatever. And it just comes through the love that I have for myself and my life. It, it comes through no matter what. And I wouldn't do anything to change that. Not for anything, not for all the money in the world, my health and the way I love myself, man, that's everything. I, what, what more would you want? Beautiful, Christy. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really inspiring. And, uh, I only wish that I had your hair that I could, you know, color it and put some cool colors. I used to have John Bon Jovi hair. I put some blonde streaks in my hair, and then later on, I was a little bit, uh, I was, I was a little bit insecure about my hair loss. So I used to put stuff in my hair to create the illusion that I had more hair than I actually did, until I just went, ah, you know what? That's it. I am who I am. I'm going to shave it off. But you, do you still sing in? Uh Oh, living on a prayer. <laughs> do you still sing that into the broomstick? I know. I know. Of course. Oh. I do in the shower, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good. Christy Nickel, thank you so much. And for the listener, go and check out Christy's uh, amazing work. Uh, you can go to coderedlifestyle.com. Where else can our uh, listener find more about you, Christy? I've got my own podcast called Rebel White Loss and Lifestyle. And more than likely, if you're a podcast listener, you can find me over there. I'm very authentic. The way I'm talking to you guys now is the way I talk to you, whether you meet me in a church parking lot or a 7-Eleven or anywhere. So my podcast, you can, you can go to our, we have an app. We have all kinds of places. I have a YouTube channel. If you just go to Christy Code Red, you'll find me everywhere. Christy Code Red. I love it. There you go. Well, thank you so much, Christy. And I also just want to say before we go, thank you so much for being a big supporter of uh, my other business, the Swanee's Blue Light Blocking Glasses business, because you've uh, you've actually promoted our uh, my sleep company and our sleep products uh, over the years. And so I wanted to say thank you very much for your uh, for your partnership on that. Well, you have been so good to us, and I've been approached by other companies, and I just were like, nope, nope, we're gonna stick with we're gonna stick with Swanwick. We're not going anywhere. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Chrissy. I appreciate you uh, being here and giving us your guidance. And to you, the listener, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. See you. Here are five ways I can support you on your health journey. Number one, the Better AF group support. You can go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash better AF. That is group virtual coaching to help you to stop drinking. The YouTube channel at alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash YouTube. The book, Alcohol Freedom Formula, can be found at alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash guide. My liver cleanse from my supplements company, Swan Vitality, at swanvitality.com. And protect your eyes from screens by wearing a pair of Swanies blue light blocking glasses from my sleep company, Swanic Sleep. You can find that at swanies.com. Catch you on the next one.